Oke, okay. thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. I hope everyone is healthy. Stay safe. If those who are watching this outside, don't worry. Uh, don't worry. Don't forget to use your mask and don't forget to wash your hands often with water and soap. Uh, that's uh, inter an introduction. Uh, I'm Yudi. On behalf of Simeo Recfon, I would like to welcome you all to this online lecture series uh, titled Iron Deficiency Anemia Consequences and Solution for Reproductive Health. Um, I am happy to see uh, that there are some of you watching now um, from Indonesia and outside Indonesia, and we are happy also to have our uh, speaker from University uh, in from International Medical University Malaysia. And uh, I would like also to, to say that online lecture series has been our mode for sharing or disseminating information on uh, food, health, and nutrition uh, since 2017. And we have hosted uh, this uh, session uh, in collaboration with CMU Secretariat, but ever since 2018, our online lecture series are self-run by Simeo Recfon, and we are happy to have uh, fabulous speakers and hundreds or probably thousands or, of viewers that has been enjoying uh, the program. And with regards to IMU, I would like also to address that this is a particular uh, active collaboration that we have had with Malaysia so far. So we have uh, come into uh, an, um, a, um, a memorandum of uh, understanding since 2019. And this has been the third uh, online lecture series uh, shared by IMU faculty. And we are hoping that there will be next uh, in the coming years. Um, uh, with IMU, IMU itself, we have a uh, few collaboration, few projects together, and then we have actually roadmap some activities under sharing of uh, information, sharing of uh, research results. We would uh, have also upcoming projects on training, collaborative training, as well as collaborative research. And in the future, <clears throat> we are aiming as well to have internship program and faculty exchange. Uh, we have started some actually this year, but because of the pandemic, we have to cancel all of those um, uh, travels activities uh, among the two organization. And this year, the second half of this year, we would like actually to have a wider coverage of our OLS. So that's why uh, this uh, second semester, we are inviting uh, our partners, our other partners, to moderate the sessions. And therefore, I would like now to introduce Dr. Arif Sabta Aji as the moderator. Uh, he is currently affiliated with Alma Ata University in Yogyakarta. He gained his uh, recently uh, his doctorate degree from Andalas University in Padang with a twinning program with uh, University of Reading in UK. He is currently uh, the founder of Ask Your Dietitian, as well as the president for Millennial Voice on Stunting. So I think without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Aji to moderate the session. Thank you. Okay, um, the operator, can you show up my video? Okay, um, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much to Judy for introducing me and have a good wednesday to you all all the participants i hope that you all still stay safe and sanitized during this pandemic of covid 19 and today is very special because 
uh, we are back again in the online lecture series Chameo Response in collaboration with International Medical University Malaysia. And we have an honorable guest speaker today. She is um, Associate Professor Snigda Misra. Hello, Dr. Snigda. Okay. And thank you for uh, above uh, more than 400, 400 participants that have been registered for joining this online lecture seminar today. And before we start the presentations, I would like to read the sequence of this lecture. This lecture is divided into two sessions. The first one is presentation that will be given by Dr. Snigda. And the second is the Q&A session. So for you guys, the participants, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can uh, set your name and organization while asking a question in the uh, comment column, in the YouTube comment column. And, and now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Snigda. She is a head of department in the Nutrition and Dietetics School of Health Sciences at International Medical University, Malaysia. And International Medical University, Malaysia is basically located in Kuala Lumpur. And she has a more than 26 years experience teaching in nutrition. And her research area is in child nutrition, public health nutrition, micronutrients, and obesity. And Okay, I'll try to connect with Dr. Snigda. Hello, Dr. Snigda. Yes, can you, am I visible? Yeah, you are visible now. Okay, how are you, Dr. Snigda? I'm doing good. Yeah, nice to meet you. Are you ready yeah. to give a talk today? Yes, yes, by all means. Okay, so to Dr. Snigda, the time is yours. You have uh, 40 minutes for talking. Okay. A very good morning to every one of you, all those of you who have logged in. A good morning to everyone in Asia and a good evening from the West. It's my pleasure to um, speak a few um, top, uh, 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 to speak a few um, of and share experiences on this topic, iron deficiency anemia. And thank you very much, Dr. Raji, for the warm welcome. Without further ado, I would, uh, would like to delve into the topic of iron deficiency anemia. This is very commonly seen, especially in our part of the world where you and I mostly belong to. That's in the Southeast Asia as well as South Asia. Now this has been in vogue since generations and I'm sure we all have been hearing about this. So today I shall take you slowly into what we are going to uh, discuss, what this anemia is about, and how are we going to tackle through or wave through this pandemic? Let me walk, walk you through the outline of my presentation. We, should, we shall be looking at the prevalence of anemia, the clinical significance, adverse consequences, dietary adequacy, impact of COVID-19 on global nutrition, lessons from COVID-19, and the possible solutions. We all know that anemia is a most widely prevalent nutrition problem in the world. It does not spare anyone. It affects all ages, sex, and across physiological groups, especially, especially the vulnerable groups like the preschool children, <clears throat> adolescent girls, pregnant and lactating women. It also adversely affects the morbidity and mortality among the children. Many Epidemiological studies have shown its high prevalence and risk for child as well as maternal mortality. 
And we also have the evidence that a large number of anemic children live in Southeast Asian countries, signifying the need for immediate actions and concerted efforts. If we look at the global prevalence, 2 billion people or about 30% of the world's population is anemic. 42% of children from zero to uh, 59 months of age or below five years of age are afflicted with anemia. And 40% of the pregnant women are also affected with anemia. Now moving on to the iron deficiency anemia, which is of our prime concern. It is one of the most prevalent nutritional deficiency worldwide, affecting an estimated uh, population of four to six billion. It's also the main cause of anemia among young children and women, and it can affect both the high or the low infection burden settings. The, Anemia is about five times highly prevalent in lower and middle income countries as opposed to the high income countries. But that does not mean that the high income countries are not afflicted with anemia, which I shall be sharing with you in my future slides. We are also aware that it's one of the largest nutritional deficiencies in the world and leading uh, one of the five leading causes of global disease burden as well. On a global scale, about 75 to 80% of all anemias occur in the reproductive age. In Malaysia, one in five uh, Malaysians were found to be anemic. And this was released recently in the National Health Morbidity Survey of 2019. 21.3% of the population is considered to be anemic and three uh, women of the reproductive age um, were anemic out of 10. If we were to look at this slide, which gives you the density of anemia globally. Globally, anemia affects more people than any other health problem. And this data is for the pregnant woman, which was captured in 2016. Anemia has important implications for general productivity and development. It reduces the work capacity of individuals up to 20%. And that's all the more reason why we need to look at it from a global picture rather than from a regional picture. In most serious cases, anemia can also lead to the exacerbation of disease and health. Let me draw your attention to the global estimates of the prevalence of anemia in the reproductive age in 2011. Now comparing it to the picture that I just uh, shared uh, in the previous slide, you will see that there is not much of a difference. So five years down the line also, we do not seem to have grown out of uh, the problem of anemia or have been successful either in combating anemia. Now, if we were to look into the data of the prevalence amongst pregnant women from 1990 until 2016, you can look at this data pertaining to South Asia we are still at 50%. What does this indicate? This indicates that micronutrient deficiencies are a global issue as we saw in the previous slide, as well as in this current slide where no country or no continent is spared from the um, infliction of anemia. Unlike energy protein undernutrition, the health impacts of micronutrient deficiency are not always acutely visible. It is therefore termed as hidden hungers as these two terms can be interchangeably used. What's the etiology of iron deficiency anemia? The total body iron in a 70 kg man is about four grams. 
This is maintained by a balance between the absorption and the body losses. Although the body absorbs only one milligram of iron to maintain the equilibrium, the internal requirement for iron is about 20 to 25 milligrams. We are aware that an RBC has a lifespan of 120 days so that 0.8% of the red blood cells are destroyed and replaced each day. A man with a five liter of blood volume has 2.5 grams of iron incorporated into the hemoglobin with a daily turnover of 20 milligrams of hemoglobin synthesis and degradation and another five milligrams for other requirements. Hence, the iron equilibrium in the body is normally regulated very carefully to ensure that the sufficient iron is absorbed in order to compensate for body losses of iron. So what's the clinical significance of iron deficiency anemia? It negatively affects the physical and intellectual development of the young children below the age of three years. Additionally, the prevalence of anemia is highest at the ages of six to 12 months, which is a very, very critical period for the psychomotor development. Some studies have also shown that infants with iron deficiency have lower auditory brain system responses than those with normal iron levels. And this results in delayed central nervous system myelination or amongst the young children. Iron deficiency in neonates is also associated with cognitive and behavioral abnormalities, but these abnormalities are not reversed even after there is an iron repletion. So iron deficient mothers can give birth to iron deficient neonates as well. The WHO diagnostic criteria and classification states that the cutoff value for anemia in women of reproductive age is, is less than 20, uh, 12 grams per deciliter of hemoglobin and in preg pregnancy it is about less than 11 grams of hemoglobin. Mild anemia is defined as a hemoglobin concentration between 90 to 110 grams per liter. And subsequently higher than that, you have moderate anemia and then severe anemia, which has a cutoff point of less than six grams per deciliter. Iron deficiency anemia is defined as a mean cell volume of less than 80 first, mean cell volume, cell hemoglobin, of less than 27 pg and mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration less than 310 grams per liter. The symptoms are very varied. It could start with extreme fatigue, weakness, pale skin, chest pain, fast heartbeat or shortness of breath, headache, cold feet, hands and feet, inflammation or soreness of, of your tongue, brittle nails, unusual cravings, especially like eyes, dirt, or starch, poor appetite, especially in young children as well as infants. Now, all the symptoms may not be presented in every single individual, but every single individual behaves differently in terms of showcasing or exhibiting their own symptoms. The, iron cons the adverse consequences of iron deficiency results in anemia during pregnancy, maternal mortality, preterm birth, low birth weight infants, birth defects, increased mortality, suboptimal health of the neonate, as well as cognitive development of the offsprings. What about dietary iron adequacy and inadequacy? We generally come to a conclusion saying that if we are anemic or there's insufficient intake of iron, or there could be poor bioavailability of micronutrients. But unfortunately, the data in this respect is very limited. I have presented two papers here, which has been, one has been picked 
from the European uh, Union and the other from the South Asia. Now look at this first paper, which is on the dietary iron intake in women of reproductive age in Europe. It is a review of 49 studies and it involved 29 countries. And the period of the study was 1993 to 2015. All the 29 European countries were included. But what is very astonishing is that 61 to 97% of the women of reproductive age have a dietary iron intake less than 15 milligrams per day. Isn't this shocking? As in one of my previous slides, I showed you regarding the prevalence figures that in South Asia, we have the highest prevalence, which is about 50%. There is another study from South Asia, apparently this is from India, where the study was done on dietary micronutrient intakes among women of reproductive age in Mumbai slums. This study showed that in intakes of micronutrients like calcium, iron, vitamin A, and folate were very far from the recommended nutrient intakes, each with a median ratio of 0.4. Low intakes of micronutrient rich foods, such as foods from animal source fruits and vegetables was also noticed. This demonstrates that in Europe, a high proportion of women have a dietary intake, um, uh, dietary iron intake, uh, which is much lower as compared to the recommended, um, in, uh, as compared to the recommended nutrient intakes. And this may contribute to the low body iron status found in many women in Europe. But there are not much studies which has looked further beyond what happens to them after postpartum. Do they maintain their um, iron levels or is it improved with the supplementation? Those are some of the questions which remain unanswered. One study in Vietnam, which looked into the, uh, the micronutrient intakes amongst women of reproductive age. The prevalence of the um, inadequate intakes below the estimated average requir requirement of the selected micronutrients are presented here in this table, which was studied in a rural community in Northern Vietnam. The overall median intakes were, are above the estimated average requirements. But when you look at the average daily intakes, they were much lower than the estimated average requirements, especially for iron, folate, and vitamin B12. The proportions intakes below the EAR were 24.8% for iron, 15.6% for zinc, 54.3% for folate. Now the same study also showed the contributions of the different food sources towards dietary intakes. Overall, cereal and starchy foods provided an average of 5.2 gram iron, which contributes to about 37% of the total iron. Vegetables provided another 3.6 grams of iron, which contributed to 25% of the total iron. Fruits and nuts, along with the pulses, contributed uh, to about 1.7 and 1.3 grams of iron, which is about 12% and 9% of total iron. So only 1.4 grams of iron, which accounts for 10%, came from highly bioavailable sources such as meat. This is another graph. Which, is, which refers to the micro intake, uh, micronutrient intakes um, compared by quintiles of socioeconomic status. Specific foods that provided the most iron in this population includes rice, chicken, tofu, sauropus leaves, mustard greens, and iron intake did not substantially differ by socioeconomic status. But what, the one thing that we can observe here is that women with higher socioeconomic status consumed more iron or from vegetables, fruits, 
meats and eggs. These are some of the sources of iron rich food. Now, there is a growing trend of veganism all over. This does not stop the vegans from receiving their sources of iron from vegan foods. You can see some of the examples. Now, these examples represent a group and not a specific food. For example, spinach and other dark green leafy vegetables can be consumed. Apricots and other dried fruits can be consumed. Blackstrap molasses, kidney beans, and other beans can be consumed. The use of tempeh and tofu is quite substantial in the Asian countries. And uh, economically speaking, it is comparatively cheaper as to the heme sources of iron. The bioavailability of iron depends on the sources from which the iron is obtained. There are two types of dietary iron, non-heme iron, which is present in both plant foods and animal tissues, and heme iron, which comes from hemoglobin and myoglobin in animal source foods. Heme iron is estimated to contribute about 10 to 15% of total iron intake in meat eating populations. But because of its higher and more in uniform absorption, it is estimated that about 15 to 35% of the heme iron is bioavailable. Non-heme iron is usually much less well absorbed as compared to the heme iron. All non-heme food iron that enters the common iron pool in the digestive tract is absorbed to a certain extent, which depends upon the um, balance between absorption as well as inhibitors and enhancers. However, it is very important to note that not all fortification iron enters the common pool. How do we then manage iron deficiency anemia? Iron folic acid supplementation is an integral part of antenatal care, as iron deficiency anemia is the focus in public health programs for the prevention of anemia in pregnancy. However, global coverage data indicates that this is far from being satisfactory. Just to give you an example, in India, uh, an, an iron supplementation program reported that two thirds of the women who were taking the iron folic acid supplementation during the last trimester of pregnancy ended up with only 17% taking the supplementation for the 100 days or more as recommended by the health policy. So adherence to iron folic acid supplementation will depend on adequate program support, sufficient delivery of services, patient-related factors, as well as gastrointestinal side effects. Now, the same can be said about another um, method of management, which is the multiple micronutrient supplementation. This can is also similar to that of the manage um, similar to that of IFA, but is uh, is given in a different form. So, if we were to compare between the efficacy of IFA and MMS, what does it indicate? Looking at this study, which was done in a uh, pro it's a prospective cohort study in rural Tibet of China. It was found that the, um, a significant increase in the hemoglobin levels with multiple micronutrient supplements compared with um, the, folic, uh, the iron folic acid supplements resulted in a significant reduced odds of anemia during the third trimester for these women. However, there is no conclusive evidence to say that the multiple micronutrient supplement is a better management plan for IDA as compared to IFA. So this study can lead us to certain questions which still remains unanswered. Do the mother and child retain the iron status postpartum? What's the implication of supplementation in the first thousand days of life? So such studies should be undertaken as a follow-up to see 
the efficacy and compare between IFA as well as the multiple micronutrient supplements. We are all battling in the area of COVID-19 and COVID-19 seems to have become a superpower in the last five to six months. This has not left the um, global mal malnutrition status untouched either. The COVID-19 pandemic has a perfect storm for all global malnutrition. The crisis will damage the nutritional status of vulnerable groups through multiple mechanisms. We can expect a dangerous decline in dietary quality in low and middle income countries stemming from the income losses related to government mandated shutdowns and deglobalization as well as from the freezing of food transfer schemes, such as school feeding programs and the breakdown of food markets due to both demand shocks and supply constraints. But malnutrition will also increase due to healthcare failures. I wouldn't call them as failures, but it is a diversion from the normal day-to-day uh, -day work on the health sector uh, to, towards prevention and managing COVID-19. This leads us to a conceptual framework on how COVID-19 impacts malnutrition, the economy, the food system, and health system. These are the three pillars of, the, of any nation, whether it is regional or global. The economy relates to the income, food prices, migration of the population as well as social protection. The food system indicates retail and markets, food supplies, food demand, premix supplies. And health system, as we discussed in the previous slide, leads to the health and nutrition services as well as supplies. Now, there has been a massive breakdown in the economy as well as the food system, which leads to hunger and food insecurity. There, there is a uh, limited access to nutritious foods, poverty and inequity is on the rise, and it has also impacted women's empowerment and economy food system together join hands to affect the diet quality. The health system contributes to the increase in illness. You can clearly visualize the link between diet quality and illness, it's a two-way process and it's not a unidirectional process. But both the diet quality as well as illness, they affect all the forms of malnutrition, including anemia. So how does the economic crisis and my, affect the micronutrient malnutrition? This is a very, um, informatic uh, infographic. Dietary consequences of increased food prices depends on pre-existing nutritional status. Among households consuming adequate diets or diets of sufficient nutritional quality, an increase in staple food prices is likely to cause an increase in micronutrient deficiencies before weight loss as these households sacrifice dietary diversity to maintain a consistent level of staple food consumption. So economic crisis can result in my, micronutrient malnutrition because there is a sacrifice in the dietary diversity. This is a very interesting um, uh, topic that I found where relative food choices across economic groups. So if you look at this, the economic status is from not poor to very poor and look at their food choices. It's very interesting to see that if they are on an average, not poor, they can afford rice, vegetables, eggs and meat. But as the, there is an economic decline, you can see gradually the um, the nutrient, micronutrient dense foods are sacrificed and compensated with the staple foods. 
So this is a very difficult trade-off, maintaining the staple food intake at the expense of the other food groups. Cereals constitute the bulk of the entirety of the dietary energy for most of the world population, including the roughly 1 billion people living in absolute poverty. These people get their calories from the most inexpensive foods in the form of the staple foods instead of getting it from the micronutrient rich and relatively more expensive foods like eggs, fish, chicken, meat, dairy products, fruits and vegetables. Due to the episodes of income shortages, especially during this COVID-19 times, and also due to the escalating prices of food, poor, for, poor households are forced to readjust their food expenditure which limits their choices. So how do they cope? The first coping mechanism for them is to replace the most expensive micronutrient dense products in their diet with cheaper calorie rich staple foods. If this is not sufficient to sustain their livelihood, they move on to a second strategy to reduce their expenditure on basic foods such as sugar, oil, and salt in addition to staple foods. So this makes it even more difficult for the common man on the ground, especially with the low socioeconomic strata to get an access to nutritious foods. So when we talk of nutritious foods, they are mostly either from animal sources and fruits and vegetables. But again, production of these foods is labor intensive, which has been very much impacted during this COVID due to social distancing. Some of the foods were wasted because they could not be transported due to the lockdown of, uh, of within the country and also across the borders. In addition, the micronutrient intervention programs during COVID has also been affected. There has been disruptions up to 75% of the antenatal care programs in selected countries during the first months of the lockdown. In addition, some of the supplements which were produced by the primary health care clinics did not, uh, were not able to cope to, uh, to uh, supply um, the mothers with these supplementations due to the bre break in the supply chain or the disruption in the supply chain. Or they did, they did not have enough stock to support their patients. So what do we learn from this COVID-19 crisis? Even prior to COVID-19 crisis, the, we were not on track to deliver on the sustainable goal, development goal number three, the target for redu reduction in anemia. And currently with this situation of the pandemic, things have become even more worse. This crisis will result in an exaggerated um, micronutrient malnutrition due to the disruption of health services, the disruption in the food uh, supply systems as well as the economic crisis. Then how do we make progress on eliminating all forms of malnutrition by 2030? The malnutrition crisis could have a devastating impact on an entire generation, let alone the present five to seven months or maybe the forthcoming one year. It threatens many key developments and gains made over the last decades. So it looks like even on the health front, on the nutrition front, we are moving back 20 years rather than moving forward even by one year. The importance of evidence-based nutrition actions at every stage of this COVID-19 crisis cannot be overstated, nor can the risks of disrupted access to nutritious foods and nutrition services. So this can be achieved amidst all the other uh, initiatives that we take through an efficient system while ensuring the four A's, which are availability, accessibility, affordability, 
as well as acceptability of interventions, which has to be contextual depending upon the region. So this leads us to certain solutions. The, one of the solutions is a food systems approach. A systems approach to nutrition reflects the reality that nutrition has multiple determinants and the shared responsibilities of multiple sectors and stakeholders, public or private. A food systems approach relates to a more holistic way of thinking and working. It begins with taking a step back to look beyond a specific focus area and understand the broader system and the goals. Let me give you an example of this food systems approach. The initiatives that support actors from agriculture, health, nutrition development sectors can come together and explore the role of biodiversity in food systems to support resilient production systems, livelihoods, dietary diversity, as well as nutritional outcomes. There is another solution at a macro level, which could be uh, also tried out, which is very much uh, similar to the food systems approach, which is a multi-sectorial approach. The multiple responses to a multifaceted challenge is a systems approach. So meeting the malnutrition challenges requires action across five key systems, those for food, water, sanitation, education, as well as social protection. So why do we need to take a systems approach? First, it better captures the importance of interactions and interconnections across different areas such as food, health, education, and crystallizes it to a common purpose, better diets and better nutrition for children, adolescents, as well as women. Second, a systems approach avoids a simplistic thinking that malnutrition has straightforward determinants that can operate in linear pathways. As I showed you the conceptual framework during COVID times, it may not be as linear as it seems to be. It puts the focus on multiple interconnected determinants and recognizes shared responsibility and the need to mobilize attention and resources from a wider variety of societal and governmental institutions. However, although the health system is clearly an important pathway for scaling up certain nutrition interventions, many cr crucial determinants of child malnutrition, such as diet diversity, are well beyond its normal scope. Instead, action is needed across multiple systems to ensure a quality coverage. Hence, a systems approach will enable us to target the key systems that have the ability to deliver nutrition at, and uh, nutrition interventions at a scale. So to summarize, the iron deficiency anemia is one of the leading causes of global disease burden. It contributes to 75 to 80% of all anemias in in amongst women of reproductive age. It has got an impact on the adverse maternal and fetal outcomes. The, pan, the COVID-19 pandemic has damaged the chain of the nutritional status to especially amongst the vulnerable groups through multiple mechanisms. And the solutions could be a food systems approach or a multi-sectorial approach, which can create a pathway for scaling up these uh, nutrition interventions amongst the vulnerable groups. That's all from me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Snigda, for the enlightened explanation uh, about what is our challenge in facing iron deficiency anemia, the consequences and solutions that we could do and initiate to improve the reproductive health. So we are entering the Q&A session. So please, all participants, if you have any questions, 
please you can write down your name and your institution and your question in the comment column in YouTube channel. And okay, let we so it's so interesting talk about the iron deficiency anemia. And the first one question is from Dick B. Lapitan from Kaki Dugue National High School. Uh, and the question is, what are the food to prevent anemia? And the second is, why do pregnant women are vulnerable to anemia? And the third is, what are the symptoms to a child with anemia? So please, Dr. Schmick there. Okay. We have three questions in one. <laughs> okay, let me try to answer one by one. The first uh, one was, uh, what are the foods what, to prevent anemia, what, right? Yes. Okay. Some of the foods to prevent anemia are the green leafy vegetables, but you must okay. be very cautious about it because when you are having uh, consuming green leafy vegetables, you have uh, a nutrient called as phytates that blocks the absorption of iron. So it is always recommended that you should include vitamin C rich foods along with the green leafy vegetables, the nuts, uh, eggs if possible, and of course the best sources of iron are the animal sources of food. So that's about the sources. Hope I have answered his uh, question. Yeah, and the second question is, why do pregnant women are vulnerable to anemia? Oh, why are pregnant women yeah. vulnerable to anemia? Now, this is a very interesting question. Thank you very much. You see, during pregnancy, the mother has to support two lives, her own life, as well as the life of her growing fetus. So in, uh, during pregnancy, the blood volume increases and there is a dilution in the blood. To compensate uh, for the requirement for the mother, as well as for the growing fetus, the mother requires more amount of iron rich foods in order to sustain uh, and not go into the anemic condition. And that's the reason why they are more vulnerable towards um, iron deficiency anemia. Okay, so what are the symptoms to a child with anemia, Dr. Snikna? Okay, the symptoms that I mentioned in yeah. one of my slides all, already are um, fatigue, feeling of weakness, getting tired, and um, uh, paler of the skin. Um, there would be loss of work productivity. Uh, these are some of the symptoms. Apart from that, the pregnant women also have a habit of pika. Now, pika is something where you try to take the non-food materials just to mm -hmm. fulfill your desire. It does not necessarily contribute to iron um, deficiencies, but it just helps you to overcome certain desires. So, yeah, these are some of the um, symptoms of iron deficiency anemia. Okay, okay. Thank you for the question, Diklapitan. So I guess Diklapitan is a school teacher. He oh, is wonderful. from the yeah from the high school organization. So if you have any messages for the school teacher to prevent the anemia during the adolescence. So you have uh, anything or something to say, Dr. Sneak there? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you very much for bringing this question up. Now, there are a few aspects here I would like to highlight. Um, as a teacher, I'm sure you would be facing uh, many adolescent girls in their yeah. mood swings. They have different mood swings because of the pubertal stage. And there are certain hormonal changes, so also the physiological changes. Now, in order to prevent them from anemia, two major things has to be taken into account. Their dietary diversity. The why I say about dietary diversity, generally in schools that we observe, even in case of Malaysia also, the, the school, during the school break, the students would like to snack on certain things which are not really healthy. So if you could encourage your students to uh, snack on fruits, 
rather than on fried foods or any calorie dense mm. food that will be a great um, achievement not only for you as a teacher but also for the student in the long run student as well yeah, yeah. so, so the again, healthy yeah. food possibility in the canteen i think yeah sorry yeah for the he healthy food availability in the canteen in the school exactly that also yeah. should be promoted if you can have more options for healthy foods the students also will be more proactive with the yeah. little education that you provide them on the uh, types of food to be consumed they will be more proactive to purchasing uh, healthier options from the uh, school cafeteria okay and the second question is coming from lestari lestari is from gunadarma university i think from indonesia and the question is uh, in indonesia applied the iron folic acid supplementation for pregnant women since 1975 and the deficiency of anemia remain high almost 50% in 2018 how does malaysia overcome anemia problem among pregnant women dr snikda Well, anemia is not a small program. Whether a problem which only Indonesia, Malaysia, or India is fighting with, as I showed you the prevalence picture, the prevalence uh, data, uh, the world over is fighting and grappling how to address an anemia. Now, one thing that has uh, come uh, come out very clear, it is the shortage of dietary intake due to various reasons which I discussed during my presentation. But having said that. one of the bigger challenges is that are we only giving ifa tablets are we checking on the worm infestation are we looking into other mm -hmm. underlying conditions which the pregnant mothers are facing that remains to be un uh, that remains unanswered sometimes we do sometimes we do not also we may not be able to follow up whether the mothers are compliant of taking um, these uh, supplements so compliance is a big factor which is uh, affecting most of these pregnant mothers because um, the iron supplementation can create a lot of gastrointestinal problems which can give more oh. and add to the discomfort to the mothers so the mm -hmm. non compliance of uh, the supplementation could also be one of the major issues so on the do documents we have that yes we have been supplementing the clinic has discharged this amount of x y z amount of um, supplements to maybe few hundred mothers but what's the outcome have we followed up with the outcome very few studies have been published i'm not sure whether actually outcomes have been followed up but what is important here is to follow up until the first 1000 days of life where you need to follow up not only with the mother but also with the subsequent child until 1000 days okay okay so we have a question that related with this question uh do the malaysia already trying to combat anemia by give uh iron folic acid or multiple micronutrient supplements to their teenagers monthly uh if yes how is the result excellent question currently malaysia is um, uh, using the iron folic acid supplements and that's mm -hmm. the um, directive from the ministry of health how about the mms sorry how about the mms, sorry? Sorry? About the MMS? Uh, no but they have not yet given mms mm -hmm. as one of the uh, major um, supplementation so now what we um we are planning is i am undertaking a study some, some time it would be starting in the next half of the year where we want to give multiple micronutrient supplementation to the pregnant mothers and follow them up until the first 1000 days of life so we do not have enough data to say that multiple mms is uh, Uh, superior to IFA or not? Oh. I'm sorry, that data has not been available as of now. Maybe some of the smaller groups are working on it, but it is yet to be published. 
Okay, how about the IFA supplementation for teenager? Do the Malaysia has already did this supplementation program? No, not yet. It is not yet implemented, but there are certain schools which has been adopted and they are um, some, uh, for some groups I know are working on this project, though the results are yet to be declared. Okay, okay. So for the next question, um, it's coming from Arifin Ahmad. Arifin Ahmad is from Polpecus Aceh. So the question is, how iron deficiency related to stunting, Dr. Schnitzler? Well, micronutrient deficiencies have got a greater impact on stunting as well. Because, you know, apart from iron, iron, zinc, uh, folic acid, vitamin B12, selenium, magnesium, and calcium are all, in, uh, are all um, they come in a package to help in the growth and development of the fetus. So if the maternal, uh, iron, if the maternal uh, micronutrient status is compromised, it automatically compromises the micronutrient status as well as the overall development of the fetus as well. And that is where stunting can be affected. Okay, so the iron deficiency is um, affecting other micronutrient metabolism as well, I think, yeah? Yes, it does. It does. Okay. Next question is from Okay. Fatima Azahra. Fatima Azahra is from Depok, Indonesia. The question is Could you give a brief solution to combat anemia in child, especially among 6 to 12 months? Could you describe like the complementary feeding to fulfill the baby's need? Very good question indeed. See, all this while we are talking about iron deficiency of, uh, the, amongst the women of the reproductive age. Remember I mentioned about what happens in the next thousand days of life. We, most of these studies that we try to look into have not reported any evidences whether they have followed up the child up until the age of two years. Now, complementary feeding is something where we have to um, also put in our thoughts too. The reason being exclusive breastfeeding is recommended by WHO, no doubt about it. And we do not um, want to debate on that. However, what if the milk production is not sufficient due to various reasons? How do we supplement the child's micronutrient um, needs? What about, and I mentioned earlier that uh, iron deficiency has, has a greater impact on the psychomotor as well as on the um, uh, central nervous system. So we have to compensate this iron through complementary feeding. Complementary feeding can start off at the age of six to seven months, depending upon how well your child is being uh, breastfed. And this complementary food can include some of the iron rich foods, be it in the form of uh, um, either animal foods or you can use the plant foods like the vegetables, which can be properly mashed and mixed with the staple food that is given as a complementary feed. And this will help to enable the child to sustain the iron status. The reason being that as uh, the child grows older, um, the uh, amount of breast milk produced also declines and breast milk is deficient in iron. And this can only sustain until the first few months without any additional iron given to the child. But subsequently, you have to compensate the iron intake of the child through complementary feeding only. Did I answer your question? Okay, yeah, nice explanation, Dr. Snigda. So for all participants, I want to remind all of you that please you uh, fill the evaluation form that the evaluation form link will be closed 15 minutes after this uh, online lecture series 
uh, close. And for the next question, we still have more questions. So please make that. Sure. And um, it's from Rahma from Undip. Uh, okay, from Indonesia. The question is: May reproductive women consume iron folic acid supplementation routine among pandemic COVID-19 situations? especially in red zona with high cases of positive COVID-19. Sorry, I couldn't hear the first half of your question. Okay, the question is, may reproductive women consume IFA supplementation routine among pandemic COVID-19 situation, especially in who, from women who live in red zona with high cases of positive COVID-19? So they did not get an access to IFA, is that uh, what you mean? Yeah. Yes. So if they have not got an access to IFA, that is one of the perils of this COVID-19. There is no other way but just to supplement, um, they cannot uh, compensate um, the um, iron folic acid from the foods but they have to maintain their own uh, status by consuming more fruits and vegetables. But having said that, it is also not easy to, because as I mentioned earlier, that there has been an access to, um, uh, there has been limited access to, or to the availability of foods as well. So in this case, if, there is a longer uh, duration and if they can, they could plant some community, have some community kitchen gardens, which can help them to consume the leafy vegetables. Okay, so I think like I have the opinion that we, we can also get uh, IFA supplementations in the, our, uh, the nearest clinic or hospital, uh, when uh, we apply the protocol, the health protocol or COVID-19 protocol, and we still keep um, our safety in the, if That's we right. want to go to the hospital or the clinic. So I That's think it's not, it's not so uh, difficult obstacle, I guess. That's right. Okay, next question. Okay, from Lara, from CMA Recon. The question is, how to improve iron intake and iron absorption in community with lack of animal source food in their diet? Very good question indeed. So as uh, you would have seen in, from one of my slides, as the socioeconomic status dec um, uh, declines or goes to the lower end, you will see it is com the food uh, diversity is also reduced. So the first thing that they compromise is with uh, animal rich foods like meat or um, eggs or fish. So the only way of compensation is through the green leafy vegetables, which has to be taken along with fruits, which contains vitamin C. Some of the vegetables also do contain vitamin C, which helps in, uh, which enhances the absorption of iron. And also, um, if you are taking high fiber foods, uh, the phytates um, also can um, uh, may inhibit the absorption of iron. And vitamin C will help you to overcome this, this problem. Okay. And the next question is, oh, wait. from Sari, Xiaomi Redfone as well. The question is how to improve hemoglobin level or iron intake for pregnant women with hyperemesis. This has happened in the first trimester in the pregnancy, which neither iron folic supplementation nor food can be followed properly during the first trimester. Yes, this is another situation where during hyperemesis, um, it is very difficult um, uh, to compensate um, not only micronutrient, but sometimes it becomes challenging even to compensate the macronutrients as well. So 
it is not um, it is a temporary phase definitely but only if the person is able to consume uh, through dietary sources it can be managed else um, there is a possibility of um, um, serum iron which is um, which is uh, uh, which can be given um, intravenously in order to compensate the iron losses. However, the intravenous uh, iron has not shown uh, good results of maintenance in the later trimesters. But for a short-term gain, definitely this is one way, uh, one solution that can be provided in the case of hyperemesis. Okay, okay. Um, we have also two more questions. Okay, the question, the question is from Kung East, Nutrition Department, Polytechnic of Health and Pasar. The question is, this is interesting question, Dr. Smita, like, when the threshold for anemia in pregnant women is 11 gram per deciliter, smaller than normal women, that the normal women is uh, less than 12 gram per deciliter, right? Even though the pregnant women should be more prioritized. So what do you think of sneak that? It's 11 grams in pregnant woman. Is that the question? Yeah. Okay. Remember I told you during, uh, while answering one of the questions, I did mention that uh, um, more amount of iron intake is increased during pregnancy. It is because okay. of the dilution of the blood and also um, the blood volume increases in order to compensate for uh, mm. both the growing fetus as well as the mother. And that's the reason why the cutoff point for uh, the uh, mother uh, of the pregnant mother is 11 grams, whereas for a non-pregnant, uh, non-lactating mother is about 12 grams as given by WHO. Okay. And the last question is coming from Dr. Purna Chandra Misra. Yeah, Purna Chandra Misra is from India. The question is, uh, practicing gastro surgeon, is non-fat diet a must to improve iron deficiency anemia in Indian context? Well, no. A non-vegetarian diet may not no. be mandatory for improving iron deficiency anemia. If, we, uh, if that is the case, what about vegans who do not even take milk or eggs? So this iron should be compensated through nuts, dry uh, seeds, as well as from green leafy vegetables with ample intake of um, fruits and uh, fruits which are rich in vitamin C. So the answer here is uh, you can replace your non-vegetarian diet with a vegetarian diet. However, the dietary diversity has to be ensured. Okay, so yeah, so we have 12 questions today is so many questions uh do we have any questions again so for participant if you have any question you can write down in the comment and let me see after dr Purna chandra mistra okay uh we still have questions dr snikda the question is from lini this this is from Surabaya, Indonesia. The question is, trials aim to test the effect of iron folic acid supplementation on iron status, usually following the three month period after administration. What the reason behind this? Is that what we need, Dr. Snigda? Okay, the iron, if I may repeat your question, the iron folic acid supplementation is given after first trimester. Is that correct? From for the trial study, like uh, the trials and to test the effect of IFA supplementation on iron status, usually following the three month period after administration. What's the reason behind this? Is that what we need? Uh, sorry, I'm a bit unclear. Maybe your voice is faltering a bit. I'm not able to hear the question clearly. Okay, you can see the Q&A session. Spreadsheet, Dr. Snigda. Okay. This is uh, the 
The question is below the Dr. Puna Chandra Mitra from India. I don't see any question below. Could you, yeah, could you please post it there if you don't mind? I can't see okay. that question. I post it in the chat in Zoom. Oh, yeah, I got it. Trials aim to test the effect of IFA supplementation on iron status, usually following the three-month period after administration. What's the reason behind this? Yes, um, all the trials and the studies that we do, we uh, do it after the three-month uh, pe trial period because that is the time of efficacy for the hemoglobin levels to improve. It takes about three months after consumption after regular mm. consumption of iron folic acid tablets. And that is why that uh, the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the testing is done after the three month period. Okay. Okay. The last question, Dr. Shnikda, the last question for today's discussion is from Ziza from um, health district organization. So the question is, when is the best time for us to consume uh, iron folic acid supplementation and how we prevent the nausea or vomiting when uh, we after eating the iron folic acid supplementation? Okay. Now, when is the right time? The right time mm -hmm. is to plan your pregnancy well. So if you are iron deficient, uh, deficient, even before the conception, some studies have looked into this, where prior to conception, they start off with the iron folic acid supplementation if there is a need. And then it continues throughout the period of pregnancy. And the reason here is to maintain the levels of iron um, and also the hemoglobin status to support for the period of pregnancy. So that's uh, one of the studies. Uh, I think a few studies have shown that. But is it, is it pragmatic? Can we do that? It, that is, remains to be answered. Now, the second part of the question was, sorry, Ajit. Uh, How we prevent the nausea or vomiting feeling after taking the iron folic acid supplementation? Well, I don't think there is any evidence to say that after taking IFA, there is nausea or vomiting. It could be hyperemesis um, uh, due to pregnancy itself. Um, so I wouldn't be able to give much of um, information or light, throw much light on this. Having said that, not everybody is, suffers from um, <laughs> nausea and vomiting. So again, the body, how the body adapts and manages to the change is um, another ball game totally. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, nice answer of Dr. Snika. And we have so much information in this discussion today. And thank you very much for your time, Dr. Snika. And we are so happy that you can join in our online lecture series. If, if everyone maybe still interesting with this topic and want to reach out with Dr. Snita, you can also email email her, email Dr. Snita, I think. Okay, yeah. so we are in the end of this discussion. Participants, I hope you can enjoy the discussions and the, the talks from the Dr. Snita and about the iron deficiency anemia, what the consequences and the solution for the human, reprodu uh, human reproductive health. And I am Arusha uh, for the Madrasa today. Uh, okay, I'll give him back to Dr. Judy. Thank you, Dr. The Raji, for moderating my session. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Smikda. Please, Dr. Judy. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, 
uh, dearest friends, yes, Nikda and Aji, I think we have picked up a lot of uh, learning uh, uh, from uh, questions, also from the sharing from Dr. Snikda. Um, we we thank again for both of you, and then probably for those who are listening to uh, this uh, online lecture series. There will be one more uh, faculty member from IMU who is going to share about sugar tax and public health uh, on August. So just stay tuned on Simiorek on social media. So we will be having uh, more flyers on that uh, for, to keep you informed. So I think um, we will end the session. Thank you so much for the two of you.